Wherever there are shadows, there are people ready to kick at the darkness until it bleeds daylight. This is Bleeding Daylight with your host, Rodney Olson. I want to start with a thank you to those who've left reviews for Bleeding Daylight and those who've been sharing episodes. I really do appreciate it. Please remember that you can find Bleeding Daylight on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. I'd love to connect with you through social media. Today's guest is inspirational. After overcoming so much in his own life, he's now making a difference for others. I can't wait to introduce you. And as always, please share this episode with others. Jana Alam Sheikh grew up in Kolkata, India. As a young boy, he saw people starving and suffering in the slums of that city. The experiences of his youth gave him a heart to make a difference for people living in poverty. He studied in the UK, graduating from Manchester University with a Master's in Business Administration. He then co-founded Pursuit International, an organisation working to empower people restricted by physical and spiritual poverty to pursue a life of hope and purpose. It's an honour to have him join us on Bleeding Daylight. Jane, thank you for your time. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. I want to know about those slums in India that I mentioned. Can you give us a bit of an understanding of what life is like for those living in a slum? Yes, you see, I, I have experienced poverty firsthand, but I was also born into a generation of poverty. My mum grew up in poverty. My dad grew up in poverty. My mum grew up in a village where there was no electricity, no school, no work. Uh, kids from the age of six or seven would work in the farm with their parents to make sure there is enough to eat. Uh, my mum was 14 when she got married, uh, not because she wanted to, but that's what happened to uh, young girls there. They had to be married off early. And she was 15 when I was born. Uh, she was uh, 17 when my sister was born. So my mum never really got to experience her childhood. And obviously, I was born into a slum in Calcutta. It was a kind of a refugee slum when uh, in 1947, India was broken into uh, three smaller countries, India, Pakistan and Bangladesh. And it caused massive civil war and stuff. Uh, and many people lost their home and became refugees in, 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 the, in India. And they found this little open space where they came and started living in slum dwellings. So that's where my grandparents live. That's where my father was born. Uh, and that's where I was born. Just to give you a little picture, uh, it was a community of roughly about 10,000 people in about one square kilometer area. You know, a typical house would be eight by 10 foot in area. Families of six or seven would be living there. There was two toilets and then one tap for the entire community. <laughs> so uh, as girls, boys, men, women, we used open drains as toilet. Um, I always say one of the first things that poverty did for me and with my people in the community was it took away dignity from our lives. So, yeah, that's where I was born. Uh, you know, you had to collect bucket of water uh, every day for all your use because the tap ran a couple of hours in the day. And we would wait for our parents to come home who goes out every day looking for a job. And the days when they wouldn't find any work would mean that we would go to bed hungry. Um, so I grew up in the midst of diseases like malaria, dengue, diarrhea, because when it would rain, the community would get flooded. Uh, and you can imagine with uh, open drains used as toilet, <laughs> the, uh, the flood is not just rainwater, but sewage and feces floating around. So grew up in the midst of hunger, starvation, but also suffering from all these diseases because people couldn't access medical care. Yeah, so uh, I, as a kid, um, I felt very hopeless and, and scared, to be very honest, because you don't know what your future holds. Uh, you see people suffering and dying, and that makes you feel scared. Now, I always say poverty is, in, is an injustice. It takes away hope from your life. It takes away dignity from your life makes you feel there's nothing you can do in your power to change your circumstances. I suppose that growing up, we only know what we only know. So this was your experience right from the start. When do you first remember realising that life wasn't this way for everyone and that you were living at disadvantage because of poverty? Yeah, uh, I mean, I experienced that quite early because uh, like any place around the world, uh, 
India more so is a land of extremes. There were places which was not poverty stricken. You know, you see high rise buildings and children going to school and people going out to eat in restaurants. The extremes of life, of privileged life and, and life in poverty was quite evident at, at an early stage which was also quite disempowering because you know that there's nothing in your power to take you out from where you were. Uh, I was about five, six years old when I, it was very clear that our circumstances limited us uh, and kept us in this trap because there was no opportunity to get education. You were always dependent on hand to mouth, depending on work that was available for your parents. There was a caste system. So you came from a certain place, so you were not able to get to white collar jobs, let's say, um, and, and there was discrimination. So uh, it was pretty evident from early on that uh, this is what is our story going to be. We are stuck in here and there is nowhere out. There's this sense of being stuck. And I'm wondering within that, knowing that this is a generational issue and that this has continued for for generation after generation in your family, was there a sense that, well, this is what it's like, this is all there's going to be? Or was there a sense of injustice that rose up within you trying to find a, a way out of that? A bit of both, actually. One of the worst things of poverty is it makes you believe there is no hope. Uh, I always say uh, living in poverty is like living in a well as a frog. You know, the walls of injustice are so high that you don't see any other possibilities. So that was, there was a sense of dread that uh, this is how my grandparents lived. This is my, how my father grew up. This is how I'll grow up. This is going to be my reality. But also there was this frustration that you knew where if you, if only you could go to school, you could have education, you can then work your way out but there was no opportunities. So that was the big frustration that there was no way for us to access that and make a difference by working hard. Um, so there was a sense of that this is going to be stuck in here because we can't access anything that would empower us to change our circumstances. So really, the systems that existed were against you. What can you do when there are systems like that? And what actually happened for you? Because obviously, life did change for you. Where did that change come from? Unfortunately, I'm talking about 25 years ago, you know, the challenges for the Indian government uh, was huge. There was a huge population of pe people in living in poverty and the government is trying to support in ways they can, but also as a developing nation, it has its challenges. Uh, there's corruption in the system. There's limitation of resources. So, yeah, you were disadvantaged by the lack of support from the system. But, yeah, you're right, Rodney. If you see me, you, know, you wouldn't say I grew up in poverty. Um, amazing things happened when I was about five, six years old. And it was all because of what local people decided to do for its local neighbours. There was a church community in, in near our community, slum, uh, and they, see, they saw what was going on uh, for generations in this community, and they wanted to help. Uh, and one of the things they wanted to do was bring empowerment in the lives of people and children in that community. So they partnered with this international development organization called Compassion uh, that works in partnership with local churches and lo really local people who understand the local issues and the best way to address them. So these people we knew from this local church came to our families and said, we want to help you guys. We want to help your children. Would you allow, allow us to help you? And so our parents were very excited. Uh, they said, yeah, well, what, what can we do? They said, well, we're going to bring education for your children. Um, we're going to provide healthcare services uh, and, and food, service, uh, food produce so you can feed your children. Essentially what happened when I was uh, five years old, I got sponsored through Compassion and to the work of this local church, which meant uh, I became the first child in a community of about 10,000 people to go to school for the first time. I mean, it was incredible. It's not something that my parents thought would happen in my life. Obviously, all, all parents have hopes and dreams for their children. And uh, all my parents wanted was that my sister and I would be able to have a different life than what they have experienced. But they knew they couldn't make that happen in their own so my parents were delighted when they found out I was going to be going to school. Uh, I remember my dad was more excited than me. Um, I received a, the school uniform pack uh, and my dad opened it up and he was so excited and he was confused to see this piece of rope, which he thought rope. It was actually my school tie. Uh, we had to go back and uh, <laughs> ask the people in the school, how do you put this on? So I don't know if you have this Rodney where you live, but we got a tie with a hook. 
that went on my shirt collar. <laughs> uh, so school was incredible. One of my one of my fondest memories of my childhood uh, was teaching my parents how to write their names. You know, it was education, broad empowerment. Uh, you know, teaching my father how to write his name, teaching my mom how to write her name. My family knew immediately that uh, things were going to be different for the future because education will put me in a place where I could access those opportunities. I could get a job. Uh, I could work myself out and my family out of poverty. I remember getting very, very ill when I was ch a child because of malaria and diarrhea and stuff. Uh, it wouldn't be an exaggeration to say I wouldn't be alive today if I didn't have support from that local church through the sponsorship of Compassion to go to hospital and then access medical care. So that's when things changed for me. Five, five years old, when some local people decided they want to help the children in the community. And through the support of Compassion, lots of kids got sponsored. Yeah, so I was not the only one. I was the first one, uh, but hundreds of other children got help. And uh, we started getting education and all the other support, which was really to empower us to change our circumstances. You mentioned the excitement of teaching both your father and your mother how to write their own names, but I imagine that that would be bittersweet because we expect it's the parents that hand those things down to the children. Was there a mix of emotions in that? Of course, that's the norm. You learn to do those things from your parents, and that's something as a father or as a mother you look forward to, uh, but that's the injustice of poverty as well. And, and that's a good example of you know, how poverty limits you and how it takes away uh, the joys and the little things in life that we take for granted, really. Uh, but also it was exciting because my father knew uh, his story wasn't going to be his children's story. And an excitement, almost like my parents lived their dreams and their hopes for their life through me. I remember when I was, um, I used to have school exams. I was always a last minute guy. Um, I mean, I somehow did okay in school, but I would always have to put an all nighter before the exam. <laughs> I didn't have it in me to schedule regular revision throughout the term. But my dad, um, I mean, he could not read uh, and write the things that I was reading. He wouldn't understand it, but he would sit next to me and just listen to me revise. And I used to tell my dad, dad, go to bed. What, you know, what are you doing? Uh, he was like, oh, I love this. I love the fact that you are reading uh, and that you are studying all this biology, physics and chemistry. I mean, it just made me realize that uh, on for him, he was experiencing all those things that we all get to do if we grew up, grew up in an environment like in England or in Australia or in America or uh, in most parts of the developed world that he didn't. Through me, he was living that for himself. So there was a great excitement for that. Yes, that sadness of I didn't get that when I was a child, but the huge excitement that, you know, I can, my children are having it and I know that it's going to be different for them in their life. So it was, it was very much uh, bittersweet, more sweet than bitter. My dad was a person who, who lived in the positives. You know, he would expect. Uh, good things coming out of a situation, not dwell in the negatives too much. You can't really afford to when you live in poverty. If you hold on to the negatives, you'll probably be never be able to come out of a deep hole because there's so much negatives that you can latch on to. It must have been quite incredible to be changing your complete mindset from that knowledge, as you say, from very young, that this is what you could expect from life to suddenly have that completely turned around in your mind. It is very much a, a change in mindset around me. Uh, I think you put it beautifully there. I have the privilege of working to support people back in my community now. And I always, with my personal experience and the little experience I've had of being involved in development work, I think the biggest challenge is a change of mindset. You know, change of mindset from I can do nothing to help myself to knowing I have the potential, the skills that God has given me to change my circumstances. I just need the right opportunity and I need to give it my all and I can change it. So it, po overcoming poverty, the first step is a, ch is a change of mindset. Uh, and the worst thing that poverty does, as I said, uh, it doesn't let you. It makes you believe that there's nothing good that can come of your life. You don't have any skills. There's nothing you can do in your power to change your circumstances. So we had to, as a family, believe that change was possible. And, and I truly believe that in any circumstances now, change is always possible. No matter how dark it looks, how difficult it looks, there is always hope for change. 
Uh, and also as a family, we believed, you know, that it's not just on our own strength we are working. We have got people who love us, are well wishes, but also God uh, works with us, you know, and uh, and He works with us through our difficult circumstances. Uh, so yeah, the first big mind shift change that we had to go through was that believe in ourselves that change is possible, uh, and that we can come out of our current circumstances, that we can overcome poverty. And I believe we are. You know, that's the biggest thing we need in our world is that belief that poverty is injustice and change is possible. We can overcome it and we must overcome it. Most of the time in the developed world, we think of poverty as a lack of stuff, as a lack of, of housing, of education, of, of all sorts of things that you've mentioned there. But you're describing something that goes way deeper than that. Do you think that's very difficult for a lot of people in, in the Western world to understand? I guess so, uh, Rodney. I, I've been, I've had some experience of the Western world, uh, and I feel like there's poverty in the Western world as well. Exactly what you pointed out, not just physical poverty, but there's a great poverty of the spirit um, in your soul. And I'll try to explain what I mean by that. Uh, you know, obviously we had um, less food to eat. We didn't always have new clothes to wear. You know, I grew up in a house that is uh, smaller than uh, my kitchen now kitchen I have in my flat in England, that's where I live now, is, is bigger than the house I grew up in uh, with my mom, dad, my sister uh, and all. So yes, there is lack of material things that you need for everyday life. Uh, but the bigger poverty is of the spirit, uh, is of uh, you know your emotion that there is no hope, that there is no change possible, that you are trapped in this environment. And, and you see that sometimes even people with material stuff, that there is a, a lack of joy in their life because it's some way or the other, they're caught up in the cycle of, I don't see hope in my life. I don't see purpose. I don't know my purpose in my creator. If you know what I'm trying to say, the, the biggest thing that we need to be empowered of is, is or, or rescued from is this poverty of the spirit. And uh, that is the big thing that keeps you trapped in there. No matter how much material support you can give, have or give, it won't make a difference. Educa- I always say education wasn't what changed our life. You know, food provision wasn't what changed our life. Ho- hospital care or medical support wasn't what changed our life. It helped us to survive better. What changed our life is that uh, the belief that was given into us that there's a God who loves us, we can trust God to be with us both through our difficult times and through our good times, uh, and that God has given us the skills and potentials to make a difference in our life and other people's life. That was the game changer. You know, once people who live in uh, material poverty, once they be- have that belief, things change for them. People who live in Lots of material wealth, but there is a deep sense of spiritual poverty. Once you have that belief, things change for you. It's very much a spiritual battle, an emotional battle, rather than just a lack of physical things or material things in your life. I remember having some of the most happiest days of my life when we didn't have much, uh, when we would have one time um, chicken curry cooked by my mom uh, because it was my sister's birthday or my birthday. And we would just celebrate with having some meat. No cakes, no buntings, no parties or anything. But it was a very um, joyful occasion because we shared what we had little with, with the family. Some of my fondest memories was when my dad would come home and he would have had work and we would cook dinner. And then he would talk about his um, a day and he would ask me about my school day. And then we'll sit and chat as a family and eat together. We didn't have a lot to eat. We didn't have three course meal or anything. We would eat some dal and rice. Uh, dal is lentils. But then we'll have great time together as a family. And those are some of my happiest days of my life. So it's it's not material that brings joy in your life. It's uh, family, time together, relationship, positive relationship, and, and hope and purpose that you have in your life, a God-given hope and purpose. Uh, I don't know if that makes sense. It certainly does. And you're talking there about a change in mindset of the things that are important, but also that depth of faith that gives you that hope for the future, no matter what may come. And I'm wondering what part that faith continued to play, because I know that even though you were now on a on a very different road, you were getting education, you had food security and all those things, 
life didn't always go according to plan and there were still some difficulties along the way for you. No matter where you live, whether you live in Australia or you live in the slums in India, uh, life is never a linear path. Is it? There's always ups and downs and uh, that's life. I remember when I was in uh, high school, uh, my dad uh, got uh, malaria and it got really bad very quickly. Uh, he eventually died because of that. Uh, he, got, he had multiple organ failure and I had to make a decision. Uh, you know, I was the only, uh, I was the eldest child in the family. I was also the only male child in the family. And my mom has never had much of experience uh, outside the community and where we lived. So I had to make a decision whether I leave school and start working uh, to support my family uh, in the absence of my dad. And if, if I had done that, um, I would not be where I am today. But there was people around us who encouraged, uh, encouraged me to continue to study and uh, put our faith in God that uh, he will provide. And he did. He did. My mom got a job and she excelled. I mean, she's such a talented, gifted woman. If my mom had good opportunity at school and of going to school and college and stuff, uh, she would have, I don't know, been a very powerful businesswoman or something. There was uh, difficult times when uh, losing my dad was one of them. Uh, and we had to continue to fight and continue to believe that uh, good things uh, will come out of from difficult situation. And I would love for my dad to be around today, but I know his passing away gave me a resilience and a tenacity in life to do things that he hoped and wished for us and make that a reality. And that helped me to go through some of the other difficult times. I remember when I finished high school and I was about to go to university, I was so scared. No one in my family has ever been to school, let alone university. Uh, it was a terrifying prospect, but I took courage in the fact that, you know, my dad believed in us and my dad believed in me and there are people who believed in me. And it gave me a lot of impetus to keep trying. And if I have a difficult day, I'll wake up the next morning and I'll keep trying again. So, yeah, l life hasn't been, you know, all upward from then. There was ups and downs. But what helped me personally, uh, I'm a, I believe in Jesus. I, I believe God ha loves us all, um, irrespective of where we come from. He has this unconditional love for us. He has got a great purpose for us. And when we work with him, you know, there is amazing things that he can do in us and through us. And that belief really took me through and to, continues to take me through all my ups and downs in life. You've touched a couple of times there on potential and perhaps untapped potential. You said that if you had left school to care for the family, then you wouldn't be where you are today. You mentioned how your mum got a job and that if she had got an education early on, it would have given her a, a very different life. I'm wondering about so many people, millions of people over the years who have lived in poverty that there remains that untapped potential. Is that something that you're seeking to, to draw out of people in, in what you're doing currently? Uh, absolutely. Uh, that's kind of become the vision for my life. Uh, you see, we, um, and this is a bit of a generalization, but there is this um, idea that uh, people in poverty, they need to be given everything in their life and, uh, and, and we do it out of goodwill, uh, out of care and, and concern. Uh, we are always trying to support them, provide them what they need, uh, but don't we always overlook the amazing potential in the people? Uh, we see poverty as an issue, as statistics, as numbers, as a resource draining uh, problem, uh, and uh, but it's not. You see, people living in poverty is the solution to overcoming poverty. I'll give you an example. Um, you know, when um, Compassion came in and worked in our community, 15 years on, the community is completely transformed. There's hardly many families living there anymore because they empowered the children there. Then there are teachers, there are businessmen, there are local leaders uh, that have come out from that community. And, and they're not just helping their fam family, they're helping other people in poverty. So, so there's two things. One, you have to appreciate the tremendous amount of potential in the people living in poverty. And true development will happen when you not just give stuff into the problem, but when you do things that truly empowers the individual to realize their potential. And, and for me, uh, that's what I'm passionate about. And uh, as you touched on it a little bit in the beginning, um, the charity I started with my friends, our focus is how can we empower a person living in poverty to A, believe 
that change is possible in their life. Secondly, believe that God has already given them all the skills they need. They just need the right opportunities. And you combine them to potential and opportunity, then the sky is the limit. And you're mentioning about how compassion had helped you as a child, but you're dealing with people of a different age. So you're dealing with people perhaps in in the teenage years, is that correct? That's correct, yeah. Um, Well, how Pursuit really started was, uh, uh, just to give you a little bit more background, when I finished university in Calcutta, uh, I studied business there, and I was always keen on, I've been sort of a person who can't look at an issue and not get involved (laughs) and sometimes i get into trouble because of that get myself into sticky situation but i guess that's how god made me Uh, but the other thing is for me it's not just the immediate fix i'm always looking for how you change the game for long term you know more sustainable changes and that was kind of what led to pursue today and what happened was i finished my education in india I was doing some work with the local organization, doing some microfinance work in uh, some red light communities, you know, helping women there to set up businesses to make a living for the family so they can come out of prostitution and, and provide the children for the children and for the family. And whilst I was doing that, I got an uh, opportunity from Manchester University to do a master's program, which brought me to England. Uh, when I first arrived in England, Rodney, I was so confused. The, it was such a culture shock. Calcutta is like average mid-30 degrees Celsius throughout the year. I arrived in England and it was like 15 degrees. People were walking around shirtless because it was summer and I was in three layers. <laughs> so a uh, complete <laughs> culture shock. <laughs> and uh, so I went there at uni. But I would go back home to visit. Um, and one of the things that really bur- burdened me was I was also quite involved in some of the children's home or orphanages uh, in my community, where, where in my area. Uh, so there was some local organization that rescued children off the streets who have no family and would keep them in those homes. And growing up, I would go around, hang out with them and, and play with them. And they were very close friends. So when I went back, I tried to catch up with them. And what I saw was uh, they have to come out of the homes when they were 18. By law, they can't stay there anymore. Uh, And then they were out on this uh, open world, and um, which was scary. Uh, They didn't know how to navigate it. And more often than not, they would end up back into the environment where they were rescued in the first place. And so it started off as, I know these guys. They are my friends. We grew up together. I've got such a different life. They're back into where they were rescued 20 or 18 years ago or something. And and that really bothered me. So it started off, how do we help those young people? What it has become now, what Pursuit does, is it primarily works with 18 plus uh, young adults who have been raised in institutions. And we work through one-to-one mentorship program, uh, providing them life skills, how to navigate life outside in the world, giving them uh, employability skills. So we help them get a vocational training. Some of them would have had school level education and would be very academic, so we would help them to go to university. We get them into part-time jobs to learn on the job skills and really one-to-one mentorship to support them emotionally to learn how to navigate life in the outside world. The goal is to kind of provide them that family style support that you would get when you first go off to uni and for them to just learn to live uh, outside an institution but also gain the skills to sustain themselves outside an institution. So I, I think last, last year we helped 16 young people go through training, you know, skills training, life skills training, and one-to-one mentorship. And the goal is in two to three years' time, they'll be able to live independently away from poverty, and that vicious cycle would be broken for good. Does it amaze you when you look back at that young boy growing up in the slum and not knowing any different to to becoming that five-year-old who is sponsored and now being able to make a difference for others? Do you sometimes sit back and just amaze yourself with how far you've come? Um, Yes and no. Uh, I feel like I've got a long way to go. (laughs) Uh, You say how far I've come, that's quite interesting. I do have to pinch myself to to think where God has brought me uh, so far. You know, my uh, my mom, I'm able to support my mom to live in a place she's 
Uh, she grew up sharing a toilet with the rest of the community. And now she has got a whole toilet to herself. <laughs> so, you know, these little things, uh, she's got a safe place to live in. You know, my sister has been through university. Uh, I only supported her to go through school. And then she supported herself through university. She's got a job now, full-time job, an amazing, amazing young woman now. So God has done amazing things in our life. And I'm married to an amazing girl, Naomi. Uh, who is as passionate about pursuit as I am. We started it together uh, and we met in India. Uh, she came on a trip to to work with the children in the children's home, actually, where I used to go spend some time. And, and then I never knew that our path will cross again in England. So long story short, yeah, I, I have to pinch myself sometimes and uh, and tell myself how privileged my life is now and how far God has brought me. But also there's an immense sense of responsibility you know, for whom much has been given, I think much should be expected. So I believe I've got this responsibility to multiply all that I have been given in my life. There are millions of children uh, in India living in extreme poverty in conditions worse than me. I at least had a family and a roof over my head. There are children who will literally live on the streets um, in the rainy season. They'll be out shivering in the cold. And, and there are millions of them. But then I had all these opportunities. So I always carry this sense of responsibility that I need to multiply what I have. I need to make a difference in someone else's life. And I believe, you know, anyone living in an environment that you believe you've got, you've got lots of blessing in your life, never feel guilty. You didn't choose to be born in Australia, Rodney, and, and uh, people in England or somewhere else didn't choose to be born here. But then we've got all the resources and opportunities we have in our life, which means we should be responsible with it. So I, I feel like I've got a long way to go. You know, um, I'm, I'm passionate about making a difference in the face of poverty, uh, but I'm more passionate about how we help the people living in poverty to make a transformational change, not just in their life, but in their community. So how do you untap the potential uh, that is in people whose lives are limited because of the circumstances? There are about 300 80 million children in the world in extreme poverty. So there's a long way to go, but together we can make a difference. I aim to do what I can, even if it is changing one life, uh, I'll do that and keep trying that for the rest of my life. Uh, but yeah, I do have to sometimes pinch myself and just think, you know, I live in a flat where I've got a bedroom and a guest bedroom and a kitchen that is bigger than my house that I grew up in. You talk about those very changed circumstances in which you now live, and and it's wonderful that your standard of living has risen, and you're working to see the same for many others. But as you mentioned, India is a country of extremes where there are those in extreme poverty, but also those who are extremely wealthy. And moving to the West, you've, you've also seen sometimes that extreme opulence. Does that sometimes concern you that some people simply are seeking after wealth? There's two things that bothers me. One, that we sometimes get so sucked up in pursuit of wealth that we define success in life and value in life in how much wealth we have accumulated, that we forget to enjoy the gift that is life, a gift that is there to make a difference not just in our life, but in others' life. We miss that because if somehow uh, it's become how much wealth you've accumulated as how successful you have been in life, whereas I actually feel it's completely the opposite. It's a trap. That really uh, saddens me, uh, and I see a lot of that uh, in the Western countries. Not everyone, but I see a lot of that. I feel like there's a great sense of emptiness and a lack of vision and purpose uh, in lives that is just in pursuit of material wealth. Uh, but I also uh, also saddens me that uh, there's such a lack of awareness, awareness of how life is, for a huge chunk of the world of people living in extreme poverty. Uh, I've seen people truly caring and wanting to make a difference, but I also have seen so many people just not aware and not appreciating what we have and also not aware how people live. And I think the big, uh, one of the big things that I want to do in life is just create awareness, create awareness that guys, uh, you know, you'd go on one less holiday in life is that's not the worst thing. Uh, you know, we we are living through a pandemic and it is hard. It's incredibly hard. Uh, we Our choices have been taken away. You know, we can't go see friends. We can't go see family. We are stuck in our house. 
But if you truly flip that uh, on its head and think that being able to do that is a privilege in itself, because for so many people living in poverty, they can't self-isolate. You know, they can't protect themselves from the virus. Uh, you know, how do you do when you've got 10,000 people in one square kilometer area? And that, you know, people living in extreme poverty, this has been their whole life. They never had a choice. Uh, they never choose to do what they want to do. You know, the choices have been taken away. So what saddens me is two things. One, we've got so caught up in the rat race of accumulating wealth that we forget to use the gift that is life for ourselves and for others. But also what saddens me is the lack of awareness that is there uh, in so many people about A, the privileges we have here, B, the, the extreme different life that so many people live around the world. And I believe with, if the awareness comes, change will happen because people deep down care. You know, we are wired and built to care for each other. Uh, if we know, we will do something about it. You've certainly mentioned the journey that you've been on by the help of Compassion and the local church, and you've mentioned Pursuit International that you have co-founded. If people want to get in touch with either Compassion or Pursuit International, we'll put the details on the show notes of this program. So just go to bleedingdaylight.net. But if people are interested in knowing a little bit more about Pursuit International, are there ways that they can help and how can they get in touch? Absolutely. I mean, um, I'm passionate about both the organisations, but we are going through some very uh, challenging time at Pursuit. Uh, you know, our main work is in India. Uh, and as you know, India, one of the many countries around the world that is going through this pandemic. And we know people personally whose life has been affected. Their livelihoods have gone. Um, they're struggling to keep themselves protected, self-isolate. So, yes, we would love to get in touch with you. We would love to hear from you, tell you more. You can go visit our website. It's www.pursuitinternational.org. So it's www.pursuitinternational.org. And you can find all the information. You can support us financially. You can support us prayerfully or in any other way you can. Um, you know, use your network, use the gifts that you have to bring hope in the lives of people we're working with. Um, so, yes, we would love to hear from you. And any questions you have, there's a contact email, drop us in. We would love to hear from you. You can also follow us on social media. Uh, we have a Facebook page. You search Pursuit International uh, or at Pursuit Int. You'll be able to find us. We would love to hear from you. And um, any support, especially during this difficult time when we are trying to gather resources to best respond to the huge need that we all find ourselves in, uh, would be much appreciated. Jana, it has been a delight to speak to you, to hear of your story, of the, the way that you've been able to be released from poverty, uh, but also what you're doing now. And that comes full circle, that you were given a hand up and you've taken advantage of that potential that lay within you and now you're wanting to see that drawn out of others. So we wish you all the best for the future of Pursuit International and uh, what you continue to do in the days to come. But once again, thank you for spending time with us today on Bleeding Daylight. Thank you so much, Rodney, for having me. It's been a true uh, pleasure uh, and I've loved catching up with you again and just want to thank all our listeners and then please know, believe that we can all make a difference, even if it's to one life. You never know what that one life can go on and do uh, in the re for the rest of people in the world. So, yeah, we believe that change is possible, that we can overcome poverty. Thank you for listening to Bleeding Daylight. Please help us to shine more light into the darkness by sharing this episode with others. For further details and more episodes, please visit bleedingdaylight.net. <laughs>